Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Did you ever wonder where the inspiration for my messages comes? Have you ever given thought to what it is that leads me to know what to share with you? I mean, after all, it's not like this is the Rotary Club and I'm here to deliver a weekly speech to you. I'm here to speak on behalf of the big G, God. Or maybe pronounced God. I'm here to share God's message with you. I'm here to tell you what God wants you to know. Well, this morning, my source of inspiration is our five and a half year old granddaughter, Phoenix. So yes, honey, like I told you in the van yesterday, this sermon comes from you. It's all for you. We were in the van yesterday, getting ready to take them to the airport after a thrilling but exhausting vacation week with them. And we were talking about what we were going to do once we get home. I said I was going to take a nap, and then I was going to wake up from the nap, have supper, and get ready for bed. But in between being the obsessive compulsive workaholic that I am, I need to work on tomorrow's sermon. Phoenix asked what I was going to talk about. And so I asked her, what do you think we should do? And she said, I don't know. <laughs> and so our wonderful daughter-in-law, Lindsay, prompted her and said, what do you think Papa Ken should share with the people tomorrow? What message can he bring them? And Lindsay said, you should tell them about God. And I thought, you can't go wrong with good material. All right, Lindsay, I will talk to them tomorrow about God. Phoenix continued, tell them about Jesus. Good, Phoenix, I like that. All right, I'll tell them about Jesus. What should I tell them? Now keep in mind, this is coming from a very precocious five and a half year old. Tell them about justice and peace. Pretty impressive for a kid who hasn't even started kindergarten yet. Yeah. She's gifted. It, it's just in the genes, you know. <laughs> Giftedness runs through our family. So, Phoenix, this is a message about God and Jesus and how justice and love are all part of our lives. You see, we spent this week with them. And we recognize that this morning is one of the special Sundays of the year. It's when we talk about the Trinity. If there's a stumbling block in our faith, and I don't mean your faith, my faith, our faith as Grace Lutheran Church. I mean for the whole Christian church since the time of the apostles. It's been the concept of the Trinity. How can we say we have one God, three persons? How could Jesus be completely human, yet completely divine? If Jesus is God, then who is he praying to when he prays to his Father in heaven? Relax. Set your minds at ease. Dial your intellect back beyond your years as a young adult, your inquisitive years when you were a student. Go back past the time when you were a know-it-all teenager. And I want you to sit here this morning with the mindset of a five-and-a-half-year-old. Because I'm, I don't know, for some of us, it's pretty easy. 
I'm going to explain the Trinity to you the way a five and a half year old would. And it's going to make absolute sense. Because you see, one of the challenges that we face as a church is trying to explain the unexplainable. And so we stumble over how we're going to accomplish that in a way that makes sense to our limited human minds. I submit for your consideration that the whole conundrum of understanding the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, can be boiled down in its essence to saying there is one God, and we encounter that God in several different ways. God is revealed to us, if you will, in those several different ways. Because it occurred to me, to understand this, we have to think the way Phoenix would think, and not let our adult minds clutter things up. Over the years, people have tried to overthink it and offered numerous examples of how the Trinity works. There are those who use water as an example. It comes in three forms. It can be a liquid, but when frozen becomes a solid, and when heated becomes a vapor. But it's still water. Each of its forms has a different purpose, but it's the same stuff. We can talk about an egg. There's a yolk, there's a shell, and there's that yucky white stuff in there that nobody ever likes. <laughs> but it's all still an egg. St. Patrick used to refer to the three leaves on the single stem of a shamrock and use that as a description of God. One plant, three leaves. Personally, I like using me as an example. You call me Pastor Ken. Phoenix and her younger sister Ivy call me Papa Ken. My students at Elsinore High School call me my Lord and Master Ken. <laughs> Well, not really. But, but they do call me stuff that my grandchildren don't. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> now, let's approach this from the mentality of a young lady who's about to start kindergarten and focus on God. Now, there's a story about St. Augustine, one of the great teachers of the church, who was an inspiration for Martin Luther. But Augustine was struggling with the whole concept of the Trinity. And one night, he had a dream. And in his dream, he saw a small boy with a bucket who would scoop water out of the ocean, walk 10 feet down, and pour it out onto the sand. He'd go back, scoop up a bucket of water, walk 10 feet down, pour it on the sand, and repeat the process over and over. Augustine approached the boy and asked, what are you doing? And the boy said, I'm moving the ocean from here to there. Augustine said, that's impossible. You'll never be able to accomplish that. And the boy replied, you call me foolish, but what about you? Do you think with your human, feeble, limited mind, you will ever be able to understand the encompassing mind of God and emptying the depths of the Holy Trinity? That's when Augustine woke up from his dream and realized that God doesn't have to be understood, but rather encountered. 
We don't have to wrap our minds around the Trinity and explain it to people who are very confused by it. It's just three different ways God reaches out to touch our lives. One God. Three approaches. Because curiously, the word Trinity is nowhere found in Scripture. There are references to a triune God, such as in the end of Matthew, where we are told to go out and baptize people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But there's nothing in the Bible that teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. It's just something that we have come to appreciate and put into our teachings as we look at Scripture. It's a word to describe the actions of God. Personally, I like, again, to simplify things, maybe because I operate best in my own mind at the level of a five-and-a-half-year-old, and consider a duck. If it walks like a duck, has feathers like a duck, and quacks like a duck, with a bill and webbed feet like a duck, it's probably not a moose. <laughs> it's probably not a puppy. It's a duck. If we look at the actions of God, we can look at what Scripture says. God is a creator. <clears throat> we heard it in the Old Testament lesson from Proverbs this morning, where wisdom, another term for the Holy Spirit, is present with God in the act of creation. Everything that exists, exists because God made it. In the opening chapter of John's Gospel, he gets rather poetic and he speaks of how Jesus was present with God in creation, and without him was not anything made that was made. It's kind of like the definition of a mother. If mama don't do it, it ain't getting done. <laughs> if Jesus wasn't there to create it, it didn't get created. So now we have Papa, we have Jesus, we have spirit, but they're all identified with creation. That God has made us and continues to sustain us in this world. Now it stands to reason that if God is going to create a universe, he's going to have expectations for how that universe operates. If there are expectations, then there have to be consequences for our behavior within the context of those expectations. It's like I explain to my students. I hold up my ID badge and say, I'm the teacher. I get to make the rules. But you're the student. You get to decide what you're going to do about those rules. You can choose to obey them, or choose not to. But then, because I have the cosmic power of a teacher, <laughs> I get to determine what I'm going to do in response to your decision. And I have numerous ways of rewarding my students. I'm sad to report to you <coughs> that I'm not going to do any of them tomorrow when I'm back in the classroom. <coughs> because the reports I got from my classroom partners was that my students took advantage of me not being <coughs> there. Shocked. I don't feel like doing work today. I'm not going to, and you can't make me. <laughs> You're right. I can't but I can respond to your decision. Woe unto you, the city of Tyre and Sidon. It will be worse for you in that day. 
Well, maybe it would be worse for those sinful cities than it will be when Mr. Puccio returns to the classroom tomorrow. The day of judgment has come. Because you see, Phoenix, it's called justice. Because we decide what the consequences are going to be when we make the choice of our behavior. And if we don't like the consequence, then maybe we need to change the behavior. And along comes Jesus, who says, I'm willing to take the consequence for your sin. Now, between now and 1.30 tomorrow afternoon, I want all of you to pray. <laughs> if Jesus chooses to accept the punishment that my junior and senior English students deserve because of their hideous behavior, please contact me. My cell phone number is in the bulletin. And let me know what Jesus has offered to do for them. Oh, wait. I don't need you to do that. Because he already has. The book of Hebrews says he died for sin once and for all. So tomorrow, oh, what a glorious day it's going to be. And now I'm thinking about it. I'm getting excited. I wish it was Monday already. I'm going to be able to share with my students the good news of the gospel. That despite their refusal to do the ridiculously easy assignments I left for them, <laughs> Jesus died for their sins. And God stands ready to forgive them. However, I'm not as broad-minded as the Lord God. <laughs> They're going to do some writing this week about the relationship between behavior and consequences. In this, the final week of the school year, when their bodies are in the classroom but their minds are already skateboarding somewhere out in the park. That's okay. Because as we look at scripture and we hear today's gospel lesson, just as we heard it Last week, in the previous chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus promises he's going to send the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, the Teacher, to guide us and inspire us. The fact that God created is marvelous. The fact that Jesus was willing to die for us is amazing, mind-blowing. But what is truly inspirational is the fact that God's Spirit lives within me to teach me and to inspire me. You want to know where the stuff of my servants comes from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. Because God is like a duck. A God creates. A God redeems. A God makes holy. If it looks like a God, acts like a God, sounds like a God, I guess it's a God. So what do we say? The concept of the Trinity is a challenging one. But again, I encourage you, don't overthink it. Don't get all wrapped up in all this person's talk. We have a God. A God who has chosen to make himself known to us in the world that we have as a gift from him, the forgiveness that we enjoy as a gift from him, and the spirit that we have within us, which comes as a gift from him. It's God's divine presence in our lives. So you see, Phoenix, you had a good idea about the theme for today's message. Tell them about God. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about justice and love. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
We worship God with our offering. 